I am now honored to welcome to the podium someone who has known Dr. Massetti for 22 years and had an influential role in his life. The former director of the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the Honorable George Tennant. Mr. Tennant served in this capacity from 1997 to 2004, making him the second longest serving director in the agency's history. Mr. Tennant received the Presidential Medal of Freedom from President George W. Bush in 2004 and is the distinguished professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University. In 2008, he became a managing director at the Merchant Bank Allen & Company in New York City. Mr. Tennant served as Dr. Massetti's first boss after he graduated from college. They both worked for the U.S. Senate Select Committee as on intelligence, as, excuse me again, on intelligence as staffers for former U.S. Senator David L. Bourne, Democrat of Oklahoma, who now serves as the president of the University of Oklahoma. Dr. Massetti and Mr. Tennant have maintained a close friendship since that date. Please welcome Director Tennant. Good morning. Um, it's an honor for me to be here at the inauguration of my old friend, Zach Paolo Massetti, as your new president. Mr. President, thank you for having me here. Um, we've known each other for over 22 years, and when we first met each other, we were but much younger men, although he's still a pretty young man. Um, and to this day, he still calls me Meat. Thank you, Meet. Good to be here. This is what I can tell you about your new president. Even 25 years ago, with shoulder-length hair, he had a thirst for knowledge and an inquisitive, curious nature that brought out the best in all of us. He looked at the world with a sense of awe, and while specialists would try to explain a complicated problem, he would step back and through the study of culture, language, history and the arts, reposition our thinking to focus on the bigger, more important considerations before we wrestled with the specific problem at hand. Why do people do what they do? What is, the, is it about the uniqueness of their historical experience and culture that makes someone a friend, an enemy, or something in between? He is a passionate and engaging man, an internationalist. He loves Italians. He is a sportsman, a wordsmith, a journalist, a romantic of sorts, I guess, a humanitarian, and a plain old get it done, died in the wool ward politician. He is an intellectual and a practitioner. And what he will convey to all of you is a deep appreciation of your history and yet challenge each and every one of you, faculty, students, administrators, to up your game, to think bigger, to engage the world and be the crown jewel of a small liberal arts colleges across this country that are so absolutely essential to our success. He will lead by example and from the front. Listen carefully and make you all feel like this is a true community. Involve all in the discussion on the road to take and then execute relentlessly on what has been decided. I have met few people in my life who exhibit his level of care for others and even fewer who carefully listen listen to all points of view, and even in disagreement, will still conduct himself with even greater grace and dignity. So now you're out there thinking, how is it possible that anybody is this good? <laughs> and I will tell you that it is possible. And all you have to do is spend some time with his mom, his dad, his sister, with Julia, and watch how they're raising Jules and Sam to know it's true. His mom and dad were Peace Corps volunteers, committed to community and public service, dedicated to the written word and teaching their children about the importance of learning, reading, and the exploration of the unknown. His sister, Abby, an Amherst and Columbia graduate, runs a successful art gallery in New York City. And finally, there's Julia, 
with a graduate degree in international affairs and a law degree. She started out in finance, hated being an investment banker, imagine that, and opted instead to pursue Holocaust claims for the state of New York chasing after Swiss bankers. I could go on and on about them, and Zach's dad service as a distinguished federal judge, but the point should be pretty clear. Jack, Zach comes from a family that showed him great love, a family where discussion and study and engagement and openness to men and women of all walks of life and the pursuit of a greater good for all of us is what mattered. So his leadership of this institution today is very relevant because we're in an important moment when people are questioning the importance of a liberal arts education. What's the sense, they say, what is the sense of training young men and women if they can't find a job? Well, to all those specialists who chant, we got jobs, Zach and I would say yes, but the men and women of Ripon College have futures. The Princeton historian Stanley Katz has written that a liberal arts education is the only intellectual antidote to the overwhelming flood of information and genuine technological change that we're experiencing. A liberal arts education that works teaches students to read and reason, to learn something about the range of human expression and experience, to recognize and construct arguments, and to have a sense of humility about the lives and minds of those that have gone before. So let me, get, let me get practical with you for a minute because for almost 24 years I was a practitioner. National security professionals invoke three words, complexity, diversity, and change. They've almost become cliches. But there's a fourth word, fast because the world literally comes at you fast and the better prepared we are to make sense of what is coming at us in light speed, the better off we will be. At the very least, a liberal arts education can help us recognize that at every level of analysis, the world is complex, continuous, and interdependent. Still, we as human beings love to simplify a good story. We love a cracking yarn, a strong narrative with a clear beginning, middle, and end. But the real stories I used to deal with seldom began with once upon a time or concluded in a tidy way, everything tied up in a neat bow. This kind of education, what you're doing here, isn't a magic potion that once you swallow everything will be clear, but it should help us understand that underneath those clear narratives, nothing is quite that cut and dried. Few conclusions are as pat as we'd prefer to believe, that even the commonplace is often more profound than we might seem on the surface. I I want to talk to you, I want to give you a sense of, I'm going to even operationalize this one more step. I want to talk to you about a man I used to work with who I believe embodies what a liberal arts education is all about. His name was Paul Frandano. I would describe him as a longshoreman with almost a PhD. Perhaps one of the most creative analysts I ever worked with. I went to his retirement ceremony three or four years ago, and it was the usual thing, a bunch of important people making speeches. They hung a gong around his neck. Everybody applauded. Then it was his turn to speak, and what he said was how much he had loved being an intelligence officer at CIA for 30 years. But along the way, before the ceremony, he would often say to us, listen, intelligence is what I do, but it's really not who I am. That day when he was mustering out and moving on to something new, he had to admit he was wrong. It turned out that Paul said, and I, these are his words in total, that being an intelligence officer was exactly who he was because intelligence work let him pour everything he knew and thought and cared about into his work. Politics, history, 
philosophy, literature, economics, science, technology, language, geography, and you'd have to know Paul, it just kept going, communications, film, music, sports, family, and then he said, growing up in New Jersey, breathing air that smelled different every day, and dealing with tough guys, getting punched out every now and then, the whole shebang into his work, he said. And trust me, it was all there. That to me, that's being intellectually diverse, bringing all of your experience to the table. He loved to take the opposite side of an argument, but he was always willing to concede a point. He didn't like to talk about the truth because he knew we were always going to tell the president what we believed. He knew he wasn't the smartest guy in the room, but he knew how to ask the right questions, how to break down an argument, how to build a different argument from the same materials of the argument he had just blown to bits, how to make the people around him better. Paul Frandano analyzed China, the Middle East, the impact of environmental degradation on national security, and was my chief contrarian. He loves Bruce Springsteen, Radiohead, Duke Ellington, the opera, Shakespeare, soccer, has 2,000 CDs and vinyl LPs, 10,000 books, he says, mostly unread, that represent, in his words, the measure of his pretension. <laughs> and I can tell you, and I can tell you when he spoke in a room, whether it was the Oval Office or younger or a conference room with younger analysts, everybody listened with rapt attention because of the power of his thought. This is the kind of man or woman we want to train for the future. I talked to you about speed. Louis Pasteur once said, in the field of observation, chance only favors the prepared mind. Preparation and anticipation is everything, and a liberal arts education is nothing if it's not about preparing the mind for making sense of the world. It's this ability to make sense to understand something, to put it in its context, to be able to give a coherent account of it so that others might understand it and act on that account and to avoid the actually, the absolute opposite, to make no sense whatsoever. So today, if you look at what we're trying to understand, take a look at the Middle East. How should we think about the shifting of the tectonic plates in the Middle East? How will a yearning of people for freedom and opportunity translate into the development of civil society? What is political Islam? Is it monolithic? Should we fear it or embrace it? What will the fate be of Al-Azhar University of Cairo and other institutions of higher learning so upon which so much depends? What will we learn from social media or other sources of local opinion? How can we make sense and paint a picture in the absence of an interdisciplinary liberal arts education to make sense of all this? It's very hard. Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein once said, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. And then he said, imagination encircles the world. In Zach Massetti, you have a young president with so much talent. He will stir your imagination and bring the world to you in ways you never thought possible. And we are all rooting for him and for you and this great community of learning. Thank you very much for having me tonight.